Hey, welcome back to Unschooled Theology. I am one of your hosts, Derek. With me is Evan. Good day to you, sir. Good day to you, sir. All right, here we go. We are talking uh, for the second time because a uh, little, little behind the scenes, we recorded this and the next episode actually already and then realized we weren't actually recording them. So <laughs> we... We did a uh, dress rehearsal, and now we're here for the real thing. So We're going to be really that. good at this one. Yeah. It's going to sound great. <laughs> let's hope so. Uh, ends up being our worst sounding episode. Yeah, right. Uh, all right, so Genesis 3, verses 9 through 10. I'll read them now. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. All right, so we have this, we have a separation that we see here because God God knows where the man is, right? He's God. He wouldn't be God and not know where the man is. But the idea of God calling out to the man and asking where he is, I think that demonstrates to us a, a kind of lostness that the man and the woman now face. They're not even, you know, exiled from the garden at this point, but something has changed in their relationship with God. Um, but we've talked before in this passage, right, about this being the idea not of original sin, like this moment that happened in time and human genetics were altered. <laughs> we, were, we were genetically predisposed to sin from this point on, um, but rather this being the story of universal sin. So this story of man and woman describes all of our relationship with sin. And that makes the call that God puts forth here uh, a call that goes out to all of us. He wishes for us to return to him. And so he's calling out to all of us, asking where we are. Um, if this, if we view this, right, as sort of our universal relationship with sin and God and all of that. And so there is a way in which God is calling out to all of us. And that being the beginning of the path to redemption right? There's this separation, and there will even be more separation with the exile, but the beginning of the path to redemption is God calling out to us. We'll talk more in, in a future episode about why maybe it needed to be God calling out to us, but... Um, well, it raises the question because you point out um, that, that God should, and this is pointed out all the time, God should know where they are because he's God. Right. Um, and, it, and it, of course, ask, that, that makes one ask the question is why, why would you ask a question? Um, and what hits me too is you oftentimes, you, you ask questions a lot of times to get somebody to, to watch how they respond to that question and to, and to, and to indicate something to them. Yeah, kind of um, Socratic rather than method. just yeah, yeah. Rather than just stating something to them, you're you're saying let let's let Adam watch how he actually responds to this question. Yes, um, although recognizing that he's that he's not there, how is he going to respond to that? Yeah, and although we look at that, we'll, as we'll look at Adam's responses here, or the man's responses, mm -hmm. he's not yet referred to as Adam, but mm -hmm. the man's responses here versus the woman's, which we'll see down the road. That idea of um, developing some sort of realization we'll see that maybe the man never even quite really grasps what's going on. Whereas the woman here really we'll see in her answer has a real grasp of the situation. So mm -hmm. um, if we look at verse 10 though, right? Um, this is another place here where we find a lot of assumptions being made. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. A lot of assumptions about, and we'll find that through this whole passage. Um, there is, I think, I think there's a tendency to, put within the man and the woman in this section um, the, the, the mindset and the heart of an experienced sinner, right? Mm -hmm. um, someone who's, who's sinned before and familiar with it and mm -hmm. behaves in certain ways as a result of familiarity. And I think it's very important to remember, like, no, this is, this is a first experience with sin. And so there's not an experienced sinner. That's why we've referred so much to the idea of children and parents, right? Because there is that idea of the immaturity and the realization that's occurring here, um, not the idea of being experienced. So for instance, like this chapter, one of the, or this verse, one of the things that uh, is often suggested is that, well, the man is hiding because he had done something wrong. That's why he's hiding. Mm -hmm. But then we have to then assume he's lying here right which is often the accusation because if we look at what he says 
um, it's something different. And because we haven't been told he was lying, maybe the reason that he hid, we have no reason to, to assume right now that his words differ from his intentions. We haven't been told that they do. And ourselves as experienced sinners might read into it, but perhaps that's revealing more about ourselves than the man here in the passage, right? When we read in these different intentions, because we have no reason to add that. We can, we can just read it and assume that the words that he says are his intentions and that he is just speaking plainly and clearly the way a child often, when they do something wrong, they'll answer, you know, why did you take that from your sister? Well, I wanted it, right? <laughs> Not that, you know, eventually they might come up with some sort, well, I thought they might, I thought they might choke on it. So I thought it wouldn't be good for them to have it. So, so I took it instead, when in reality, they just wanted it, right? They will eventually reach the point where they'll make up some story of why it was better for their sibling to get that taken away from them. And they could play with it now. And it was actually just for their sibling's sake. They'll reach yeah. that point, but yeah, that's um... not... And there's not a lot of depth there too, because it's, they're saying I want it. And they're not saying as, as we would, as interpreters of this might say that he should have said, I, because I ate from the fruit and of the tree and I realized I was naked in the same right. way a child would say, I took it because I wanted it. Not because they won't say I took it because I wanted it. And I decided to ignore that time where you told me to, to share toys and to not steal things. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, no, no, that's not that. This is, this is, this is naivete. It's like, it's, yes. it's not, it's not like he's experienced. It's not like uh, the man, the man doesn't seem to have another agenda. And if there, if it was crucial to the story, or there at least our understanding of the story to know that the man had another agenda going on, the story would tell us. Right. Like, Right. If, if we're really if we're really looking at this and as believers do and say oh this is this is god breathed this is this is god's uh story to us why would he not just simply replace the word said with lied or deceived right and so and and we're told here so i, I guess we should re re-emphasize we're told that here here that that what the man did was hide because of his nakedness mm -hmm. and if we look actually at the preceding verses we see, I think, that the man's not lying here. Because if we look at the preceding verses, what is his concern? It's his nakedness. Nakedness, yeah. He wasn't trying to hide the, the remnants of the fruit or somehow like make it look like he hadn't eaten the fruit from the tree. Mm -hmm. No, he was sowing fig leaves to cover his nakedness and hiding in the trees because he was naked. The concern for the man is the nakedness, right? And I think it's I think it's worth pausing on that, right? And noting that the man is not hiding because of his sin. He's not hiding because he ate from the tree. He's hiding because he now realizes that he's naked, right? So he's not, he's hiding because of the result of the sin and not because he sinned, mm -hmm. exactly. right? Exactly. Um, and so that's which that's powerful. That's powerful. That's that's a that's a far more um, that's a deeper view of of what sin actually does. Um, because we talked last time, um, and you talked about uh, the last verse, the preceding one being the lowest point in the Bible, where man hides from man and woman hides from God when he shows up as a result of the right. nakedness. Then the nakedness being his recognition of inadequacy, inability to match up. Um, is what it seems like that nakedness to be maybe something of shame involved in that um, but he's not trying to cover up the sin in fact he is or he's not trying to cover up the sin and he's also he's trying to cover up the fact that he's naked he's not trying to cover up the fact that he realizes he's naked he says that to god like right. without, without even thinking right. about it um, right. and is very clear about that is like i i am I am experiencing something that I haven't experienced before. And it's not like he wasn't naked before. So that's, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a powerful difference between that. It makes, it makes man look less. Well, I guess this is what the nakedness makes him realize too. It makes him look less competent. He doesn't know how to deal with this newfound knowledge. And yes, and so he is, he is, he is. Well, this um, is, this is the, the unabashedly gap between honest knowledge about and wisdom. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. We see here that now he has knowledge, but he still lacks wisdom. Right. Mm -hmm. 
And it's, it's, uh, it is the wise thing to do in this circumstance. Uh, maybe, I don't know, who, who knows how much wisdom I have, but perhaps the wise approach would have been once he had seen his nakedness to immediately seek God, come before God and say, I messed up, right? That's not what he does, right? He has the knowledge, but lacks the wisdom. And so he just attempts to cover it up, right? Well, it's not even clear. And distance himself. Even understands, he, in a, he even understands the connection. Right. It's not even right. made clear that he knows that, oh, because I had the, the, the fruit, now I know that I'm naked. Right. It's, it's, it's just, that's the thing that hits him. And it appears to be the pressing reality for them now is that, is that they both, they can't get away from that fact now that they're exposed and, and they're vulnerable and get away from God too. Right. That they, they, they push themselves away from God. They are mm -hmm. the ones who go into hiding, right? Mm -hmm. God didn't chase them into hiding. They put themselves into hiding. And in terms of understanding what they're, they're thinking right now, what they're, they're sort of perceiving about themselves in this section, uh, an example might be if you think about freshly fallen snow. I live in Michigan. You live in Colorado. We've got, we've got plenty of snow. No, <laughs> we see true. that plenty, right? Um, but if you think about the, the first snowfall, and it's just everything is just smooth and perfect and clear and, and, and pure, right? It just has this, this pure, wonderful look to it. Uh, I personally, I'm always filled with a, a, little, a little twinge of regret when I have to like go outside for whatever reason <laughs> that day, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like yeah. now there's going to be a footprint and it's never going to be the same. And, and when I shovel the snow and it's that snow is going to be there, more snow is going to fall on it. Now there's going to be a mountain. It's not going to be that wonderful, you know, serene, pure thing. It's spoiled after I, I involve myself with it. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and that to me is, is the kind of feeling I get or sen sensation I get when I think about the man and woman in this chapter, that they are, now that they have the knowledge of good and evil, but not the wisdom of what to do with it, they see themselves and they see their nakedness and their impurity. And remember, the term for naked now is one that connotates a sort of shame and impurity to it versus sort of the innocence in the previous uh, Hebrew term used to say naked right at the end of chapter two. So they now perceive that about themselves and they flee from God. They run from God because God is that, that pure fallen snow. And they, I think they recognize themselves as potentially something that shouldn't be involved with that. It should be separated from that. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so yeah, that's, I, I think that is, uh, that is what sin does to us. <laughs> you know, it's, it's sort of, as we, as we become aware of our sin, um, you develop a sense of wanting to be separate from that, which is good or feeling like that's, that's actually the rightful order of things is I, yeah. I, I should be away from that. I shouldn't be corrupting that. You there's know? this, there's this, there's the image that, 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 um, that develops over time in the Bible, um, and culminates in revelation of God being a judge, um, but I think that only that develops more so as humanity's understanding develops of what a judge is rather than like God turns into a judge. Mm. It's, it's, it's humanity that shifts and then, and then is confronted by God because it seems even right here, God acts as a judge. He acts well, so as a judge by his existence in relation to who we are. If we can go back to some of our first episodes and the idea that it's our, our experiences and our, our interaction with the world and with each other and all of that. Mm -hmm. It's through that, that God re reveals himself to us. Mm -hmm. And so that aligns with what you're saying, that it's like, as we develop more understanding, we start to recognize more of who God is, right? And mm -hmm. since he's infinite, we'll never run out of things to discover and learn about who he is. But you know, that, that's something we sort of uncover and, and understand is, is the idea of him being a judge. Mm -hmm. 
you yeah. know, as we as we move forward with that, which he is fit to do because he has the wisdom that we and the man and the woman here lack. Yeah. Well, right. And judgment, judgment is judgment oftentimes has to do too with with what is what is possible. Um, what is what is what is optimal. I mean, judgment g- gets to determine what is good and what is what is wrong. But there's a way in which seeing God, seeing goodness, and seeing something as being good, that acts as the the judge on us. We immediately they are the man and woman. In this Once context, you have something to compare it to, immediately see. Oh yeah, I'm yeah. not there. I'm yeah. I'm not that yet. You know, you run into this. Um, this would be like a. I there's a uh, who's the pianist. Uh, Oscar Peterson is a jazz pianist from like the 1980s. Uh, there's two pianists. Oscar Peterson's from the 1980s. And there was a guy named Art Tatum, who's from like the 1920s, who was an incredible jazz pianist. Mm-hmm. Just, just he would, he shocked um, Sergei Rachmaninoff, who saw him live mm-hmm. when he visited yep. the United States. They were shocked by his playing. He was an incredible uh, player. And um, Oscar Peterson uh, said that the first time when he was younger, he listened to Art Tatum recordings of him. And he said he didn't touch a piano for the next two months. Right, right. Because that was the judge. It was just like, yeah. oh my gosh. What do you do if, after that? If that, yeah, if that exists, then how can I ever, ever right. even, even deem right. to come close to that? So right. that's, a, that's, right. that's the idea. I, I want to I insert just this analogy too, because we talked about in the previous episode and I are in our unrecorded episode. And I think it, I think it's potent too, is I think this idea of, of nakedness and inadequacy goes very deep for humanity. And I think we see that in um, the, the fringe edges of the modern environmentalist movement Um, and more and more and more the mainstream of it is this, uh, is this feeling that humanity is a plague on the planet. And most of these people have, have eradicated the idea of God. And, and so they don't tend to look at themselves as being inadequate standing before God, mm-hmm. but they still understand instinctually that they're inadequate. And so therefore they, they aren't even worthy to be on the planet. Right. And that's, right. And, and that's what's that's. Yeah. Humanity is, is uh, some sort of um, plague that's been injected upon nature rather than a part of nature. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. exactly. Rather than a part of this. And that's because they don't have, they don't have a, a, the understanding of standing before God and saying, I'm inadequate. Right. So they have to replace that with something. Yes. And they have to stand before nature or and, the yeah. earth <laughs> and right. say, we are inadequate. And it's like, well, what does that even have? There, there doesn't even within your structure seem to be a clear measure of that but you no, but it, it does go it, deep it, though that you understand it shows how that you are that is yeah you're actually, we, yeah, you we all that understand naked. that yeah. yeah 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 exactly yeah. and so if you don't if you don't believe a story like this one right um if you don't believe this story then you're going to have some story that will will justify that feeling mm-hmm. and make mm-hmm. sense of that feeling right Exactly. Um, although we would say, no, this is, this is why you have that feeling. <laughs> this is, this story explains why, um, yeah. you don't need to, to add, you know, this, this nature element one. Um, and in many yeah. ways, of course, as we've seen that very much the idea of the, the comparison with nature runs very counter to what we've seen, because mm-hmm. we're meant to be actually these sort of the image of God within nature, right? And so there's mm-hmm. a sense of which is kind of true that we're not like, we're not fully a part of the earth, right? But we are still, we're, we're part that part, we're part heavens, part earth come together to oversee this, right? Mm-hmm. According to God's God's order. But, um, but yeah, yeah so. But, but then earth gets replaced as God. That's what's so, that's what's, yes. that's what's so corrupt yeah. about it. I mean, that's why it's like Nietzsche who, who saw this a hundred times over a hundred years ago, as, as the church is falling out of favor, sees that, that God being dead is not something to rejoice. It's, right. it's not, it's right. not, no, that's going to be replaced. And that needs to be replaced with something. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So if we, uh, if actually, we... I should say it doesn't need to be replaced, but his instincts of like, look, that's not gonna, well, it creates a there... whole, Right. There, there's yeah there's yeah. there's not it's not like we're going to get rid of god and then we're going to just 
be whatever we want now the right. way like a uh, right. the way a Dawkins might have you think that atheism functions is like right. we're all going to die anyways and it doesn't matter so live however you want it's like well people in practice don't actually do that yeah it's not that so it there needs, must be some sort of yeah. depth to that it's it's not that it needs to be replaced it's that it will be replaced it's like no that is that's so foundational the idea the the roles that god fills right mm -hmm. are so foundational to human existence that if you pluck the idea of God out from under there, inevitably something else has to fill it. Otherwise, just humanity doesn't exist, right? It's exactly. just, we don't function without exactly. that. So we will fill it with something if we remove God. Yeah. Often, I mean, not often, only you can fill that with something lesser, right? Since God is the only thing that can really fulfill that role, you're going to fill it with something lesser and lead to more problems and cause bigger issues and yeah lead to to this weird kind of self-despising that results from the the um from that sort of environmentalist extreme perspective which is moving more mainstream but that yeah, sort of it, the self-loathing uh, that comes from that yeah. lacks a path to redemption right exactly and exactly. that's the difference is the earth that. doesn't call out to doesn't call right. out to man and say right. where are you yes yes it, it's a it it's it's um it's apathetic it doesn't it doesn't yes. care yeah yeah exactly exactly and that's what we have here is you know that that pure blanket of snow is basically saying don't worry i'll be okay right come to me yeah come yeah. here right and that's what's happening that so we look back at at the previous verse verse nine and that's really what's happening as god is calling out and it's important to note here that what's happening, as minimal as it is, man here is taking the next step in the redemption process mm -hmm. because he's not fleeing. He's not continuing to attempt to hide. Now, of course, those are both futile tasks, obviously, because he's God. Uh, but, you know, look around the world. People have no shortage of energy, it seems, to I mean, waste on futility, it's right? Not evident, it's not evident right. that man knows that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's head, true. And that's it's true. not evident. Yeah. It's not evident that he fully understands anything. With that's, his, responses. Yes. his answers give that. Yeah, definitely give the idea that he does not really fully understand that. So so what we do is we see him come to God. Right. As so as small as that is. And even though he doesn't admit his wrongdoing here, because and this is something we will talk about in coming episodes and here is you know, you and I both think we don't really get the sense that he fully grasps his wrongdoing at this point. Right. Um, and that's sort of, that's actually part of the problem with the masculine perspective is it's, it doesn't really get a grasp on things. That's what makes the feminine perspective so important. Um, so he does, he doesn't admit his wrongdoing, but he stands before the one he has wronged. And more importantly, he stands before the one that he knows he is, naked before he is lesser before right he stands before the one who most exposes his nakedness he is the the one who is most contrasting to himself um and so that that makes man then something fundamentally different than the fallen angel or the demon or something like that which even when they have their wrongdoing exposed they still stand in defiance whereas mm -hmm man comes through and stands in a in a in a pose of of respect maybe might be the term here because he he answers the question honestly and and says here's what happens you know <laughs> rather than runs uh so yeah so his little credit uh as is due him there is a little credit i think due here um in terms of that and it's useful for us to understand that this is part of the redemption process, right? So when you become cognizant really of your sin, right? And before you really understand the full process of redemption, I think that is the next step, right? Is, is wanting to flee from God and then realizing, no, I, I'm invited to come before him, right? And that's, that happens, you know, in, in verse nine is that's really where the beginning of the redemption process is so um i think i talked about uh, at the end i talked about verse eight being one of my favorite verses because it shows the sort of the low point for humanity right and that's that's as bad as it gets 
Um, and number nine, again, one of my favorite verses, because that is, that's the beginning of the redemption process right there. It all starts with right there. And that's, it's, uh, it is very, very stunning when you really think of it that way, when you think of it as the idea of the, the peer driven snow saying, I'll be okay. You can, you can come forward, right. You can come to me. And so that's, that is significant. Um, so we'll, we will look next though, uh, how this situation is handled as we look at the, uh, the response from God here to, to man's response. And then uh, we'll also get the woman's response next episode as well. So uh, be sure to subscribe so that you make sure you get that episode and share it with friends. If you think they might be interested uh, like, comment, send us an email, unschooltheologyatprotonmail.com, and we will see you then.